All right, everybody, uh, let's get going for this morning. Um, hope everybody's doing well and, and people are feeling uh, relatively healthy and all that kind of good stuff. Um, people are ready for Thanksgiving and, and all that excitement. Um, today, gonna talk about uh, the last bit of our, um, or our last class activity, which is our seafood survey. Um, so we've done our opinion polls. We've we've uh, been doing graphing and various things. And so, so the last little bit here is to look at um, seafood. So hopefully you guys have been watching those lectures that I posted about fisheries and fisheries management and all that kind of good stuff. But I wanted to uh, summarize uh, what this project is about and also just sort of make sure we're all up to speed with a couple of the most basic things related to um, fisheries. Um, so as, we, as uh, we said before, and as we said in those uh, lectures, a lot of our management problems when it comes to seafood are, are a bit different than some of our other things we've been talking about, a bit different than Coastal Commission, a bit different than um, uh, you know, pollution and invasive species and things of that nature. And much of it has to do with the fact that most of our fisheries are um, you know, out of sight, out of mind in the sense. They're hard to see. We don't have a good grasp of the population structure of many of our um, exploited species. And that's partly because they're underwater and hard to see, but it's also because really this bipartite life history, this two-parted life history where we have the dispersive juvenile stage, and that could be there is an egg or a spore or larvae, whatever, and then we have the relatively sedentary adult phase that they where, wherein those organisms tend to not move too much. The decoupling of those, the fact that the propagule, um, the dispersive life history stage can be released into the water column and potentially go very, very far from the adult source makes uh, modeling, understanding, managing fish populations and fisheries um, challenging. And so, so that a lot of the reasons we're in the, the problems that we, we are in with regards to um, seafood has to do with this fact that we've not really appreciated um, what was going on. That and the, and the age old fact of people thinking that the, <clears throat> the ocean was this inexhaustible, uh, inexhaustible resource and, and supply of, of whatever we wanted, receiver of pollution or producer of seafood. Um, and as we mentioned before, you know, there, there isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship with um, a fish producing a baby fish or a larvae or an, an egg or something of that nature. Rather, there tends to be things that are non-linear in this relationship. And so the most obvious one is size. So as we get bigger and bigger, the amount of reproductive output potentially coming from one individual uh, fish, let's say, um, is potentially um, much larger than we might think. And, it, and the reproductive output goes up as they get older. And uh, so one of the key things you'll hear older folks talking about is uh, BOF, do I have it in here? Uh, yeah, no, but the, the, the so-called big old fat females, meaning the large females that lay eggs, eggs are more energetically um, challenging, generally speaking, to produce than our sperm. And so we have a big female that's producing a large amount of eggs. They can have a, a huge input, a huge impact on the population and, and the potential output of propagules and therefore the potential input to the population and the population structure. We mentioned the fact just his, briefly, historically things were different. Historically, we had many more organisms. Those organisms tend to be larger um, and they tend to be uh, cover a wider geographic area than they do uh, now on average. And so, for example, this was a white sea bass. Upper right here is a white sea bass. 
Um, these are some fishermen off Catalina uh, pulling in uh, or uh, uh, netting for bait fish. And then we have this guy, which we, we used to call um, a black sea bass. Now we call it giant sea bass. Um, and this, you know, lady caught it in her hoop skirt. Uh, just a regular day out at the beach. Okay, um, so we're into our, our second effort now. And so um, one of our key questions, and we've been working on this for, this, this class has been doing this survey for many years. Um, and the question here is, um, Okay, so we have, we, have we have different fisheries. Some are managed well, some are managed not so well. We have farmed items, we have wild caught items, etc. What should you do, right? What should you guys do? And uh, well, I'll just ask you, was it, so, so how many of you guys eat seafood or eat stuff from the ocean? Over here. Yeah, Jeremy does. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Loretta does. I do. I I, I do. Um, uh, and I would say this is a this is a challenge with a lot of our issues related to resource management and issues related to sustainability. There isn't necessarily one perfect answer, but in some cases, when we figure out there's a problem, one of the answers is, well, just don't do that. Right, just don't engage in that behavior that's that's potentially deleterious or problematic, right? So, um, and there's, you know, absolutely that that can be a valid path forward. Um, but in the context of management, you know, as a personal as a personal path forward, but in the context of um, trying to lead to uh, wider shifts and encouraging larger scale changes in behavior that doesn't always work. So take right now, right? We're in the middle of what, the, the pandemic, yeah? And so the answer is, uh, and so we're all saying we shouldn't, um, sh shouldn't mix with people outside our households for Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever. Uh, we shouldn't be traveling, right? The state of California right now has a um, uh, overnight, uh, travel ban. You're supposed to be at home. You're not supposed to be out and about after what it is, 10 o'clock or something like that, right? And those are, those are, that would be very helpful. If, if the vast majority of people or even a good chunk of people followed those guidelines, we would have less infections. We would have less people getting sick, all that kind of jazz. But obviously the reason we're in this, this problem, right? One of the reasons we're in this problem right now is the fact that um, we had very little guidance, right? And um, at least at the national level, and, and and it was mixed, and so people did different things. Um, uh, an analogy might also be drawn to the early days of the AIDS epidemic. So when AIDS came on, and, and people finally figured out how it was transmitted, you know, bloodborne and through through sexual intercourse and through using intravenous drugs and stuff like that. Um, some people said, oh, "Okay, so that that's how it's transmitted. So just stop, right?" Just stop engaging in sexual activity. Just stop shooting heroin. Just stop. Just stop. Right. And you know, some people could just stop, but not everybody could just stop. Um, and so, what we realized was saying no was not really an effective way to lead to the outcome that we all wanted, which was less spread of of the HIV virus. And so, um, so while you might choose to not, not do drugs or whatever, um, there will be some people in the population that are gonna engage in that behavior. And so, so it's important to have other pathways. And so, so some people that work on seafood and, and ocean stewardship and coastal management and things of that nature, um, like Dr. Sylvia Earle, for example, famous um, uh, person who was the first woman to head um, NOAA and first uh, deep, one of the deepest person to go um, deepest in the ocean with a individual dive suit and the newt suit, all those kind of cool things. She now has a, has her NGO where she lobbies for um, environmental protection, et cetera. She won't eat fish. She won't, she won't, we have fundraisers or something like that. She, she's like, nope, don't eat, don't eat that. Don't eat fish at all. So her response is that the resource is so stressed that she chooses to not consume it at all. But the reality is most people are eating seafood, right? Most people are, are consuming something related to the ocean. Um, and so 
I think I think just simply saying don't consume anything at all isn't necessarily the most efficacious path to get society to switch. Also, it can, in my experience, it can be hard when I've had conversations with ranchers and we're talking about managing cattle and stuff like that. Um, one of the first questions they ask is they say, are you vegetarian? You know, and not, not that, not that you um, have to uh, have to eat meat to talk to a farmer or a rancher or whatever, but, but there's a little bit of, of skin in the game, right? There, there's, there's some distrust. If someone is a, is a logger and you say, oh, I don't ever touch wood, right? I don't ever use paper. I don't ever use toilet paper. I don't, you know, nothing like that. Um, and so, so it, it, uh, it, it, one of the responses is to not consume seafood at all. The other is to let's arm people with better information, right? Let, let's help people, um, well, let's drive their spending into ways that are, are less harmful, more helpful um, type of thing. And so this project started when I moved down uh, from the Bay Area and taught this class for the first time forever ago, 16 years ago, whenever it was. Um, and, we, and I gave my typical lectures about seafood and blah, 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 blah. And uh, uh, we said, what's the answer? And so I said, well, the answer is, is certification. We'll talk about that in a second. A, a third party certification and using your, your consuming, the power of the purse, your wallet to, to buy, you know, responsibly harvested seafood. And my student said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, oh, just buy this kind and that kind and da, da, da. And they said, I, you know, I don't, we don't, we don't really see that in Ventura, you know, Oxnard, Thousand Oaks area kind of stuff. I said, oh, you guys are crazy. And so I went out that weekend. I said, I'm going to go to the store and buy some of these examples and I'll bring them into class on Monday, right? And I went out and it was, I couldn't really find uh, the stuff I was talking about, right? So I had been used to purchasing in a certain area, in a certain community, in a certain place. And, uh, and not everybody had access to those choices. And so that's what, that was the birth of this project. This project is basically for you guys to understand and for us to more broadly understand what seafood is available right here, right? And so we're focused on Santa Barbara, Ventura, Los Angeles counties. Now, some of you all, because of the pandemic, are, are scattered out and about, but, but it's, it's still a valid question. So in, in our local communities, when I go to the store, when I go to the restaurant, whatever, if I want to buy some shrimp, if I want to buy a piece of fish or whatever, um, what fish is being sold here? And more importantly, um, can I, can I, as random person walking into a market, can I, random person walking into a store, can I be um, informed enough that I could look at the menu and I could pick something, assuming that they have some decent options, that I could pick the option that's the most responsible in terms of management and stewardship of the oceans and everything. So the two core questions are, what's being sold, point of sale here, you, the consumer, you walk in to buy something in the in Vaughn's, you walk into McDonald's to buy a fish fillet or whatever. Can you, what's being sold here, one? And two, is there enough information that you could make an informed purchase? That's it. That's, that's the whole point of this exercise. So we're going to, you guys are going to go out in the next uh, week and a half or so and, and do some surveys, collect some data, and we're going to see if we can answer this question. Um, uh, Jeremy probably knows what this is. Does anybody else know what, what, what type of fish this is? I know what it is. Yes, I, I'm sure you do. Does anybody else know what, what kind of fish this is? I do. Okay, Jeremy, what is it? Is that a paracuda? No, I'm just kidding. A calico bass, I believe. Yeah, so, so Jeremy's a oh, fisherman, so he calls it a calico bass. The kelp bass. Uh, the more, the, the, the more. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so calico bass is what, <laughs> is calico bass what the fishermen tend to call it. Um, the more common name is kelp bass. Paralabrex clathratus, which is a, uh, is a scientific name. But this is a very, very common fish. Um, it's delicious. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is delicious. And it's the My second number bet. one most caught fish, recreationally caught fish in the ocean in Southern California. By far, by far. 
Uh, one, because they're super numerically abundant. So, so there's a lot of these one, a lot of these guys. They, they hug close into the coast. So they're not like a, a tuna that you have to have a boat to be really far offshore or something to catch. Um, and they're, they're really aggressive fish. So they love to eat a lot of stuff. And so when you throw a hook in the, in the water, they tend to be like, what's that? You know, some fish are like, <laughs> and they run away. These guys are like, what's the hook? Like, what's that hook? So for a variety of reasons, these guys are um, very popular. They're also a relative, a very healthy population. So with some of our fish stocks, we have um, you know, taken too many fish and their abundance is relatively low and they're not really growing very fast. Uh, these guys, these kelp bass are doing um, very well. And there's, there's, they're not, we're not concerned about um, their population uh, in, you know, in today's uh, world of management. So they're, they're a great thing to, to eat. They taste good, very sustainable, et cetera. So we'd love most of our fish to be like this, right? That you could just go down. And, and the other thing is they're, they're very widespread. So if you guys are in San Diego right now and you go to, I don't know, Point Loma, if you're in uh, uh, LA right now and you go to Palos Verdes or Santa Monica or whatever, or, or pretty much wherever, Santa Barbara, out at the islands, if, if, when, when the pandemic's over, we go to Santa Rosa. If you went out and fished off of Santa Rosa, I would guarantee you'd all have a high likelihood of catching one of these fish. Even if you're a naive fisherman and not, haven't, you know, haven't been fishing your, you know, for decades and decades. So, um, so, the, the, so it, they're a great thing. We should be eating more of them, more of these, but we tend to not eat very many of these. Um, we tend to only catch them in the recreate, well, they're a recreational fish. So people uh, don't catch them and put them in the commercial market, generally speaking, unless some fishermen got one and sold it to a local, uh, you know, seafood market and you were, you were uh, there or something. Um, but the kelp bass are, good, uh, positive sign. We can have fish in the ocean and all that kind of good stuff. But it's important that, um, you know, just to re reiterate some of the things that we, that were mentioned in, in our recorded lectures, um, not all of the ocean's fish populations are like the kelp bass. Um, the vast majority of the biomass of the planet is in the ocean. That's because the vast majority of the living space on Earth is in the world ocean. Um, and we harvest a, a relatively large amount of all that productivity. When you and I eat stuff like, when you and I eat stuff like this kelp bass, Generally speaking, we're thinking, man, let's have some fish tacos, right? Or, or uh, you know, I'd wow, love to get a little something to eat, you know, this weekend kind of deal, right? Most of the people that are eating protein across protein from the ocean across much of the planet don't have a whole lot of options, right? So, folks in India, folks in Africa, uh, uh, folks in um, South America, large numbers of folks are getting a huge amount of their uh, uh, caloric intake and their protein from the sea. So whereas for you and me, it's more of a luxury, right? If we didn't eat that fish, we could, I don't know, eat some bread, we could get some cheese, we could, you know, something else, right? Um, so for us, generally speaking in the US and in California, Seafood is something of a luxury, right? But for a lot of the world, it's it's um, a necessity. And if they don't eat the if they don't if they don't eat the fish they catch, um, they're they're not going to eat anything uh, that day. Um, increasingly, proteins from the ocean are a large fraction of what we are uh, eating. In some cases, we're eating it directly. In other cases, we're, we're taking a lot of this protein and turning it into feedstock for other parts of our, um, of our animal uh, of food uh, system. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just say that. So, so a lot of people, a lot of parts of the world really need healthy fish stocks. It's not just an issue of economics. It's not just an issue of taste. It's an issue of survival. 
real quickly to to refresh us on some of the aspects of um, fisheries dynamics. Um, recall when we say fisheries, fisheries is a general term. It means fish. It also could mean invertebrate. So abalone, an invertebrate, squid, an invertebrate, lobster, an invertebrate. In the context of seafood and managing food stuff that we ingest, we refer to these as fisheries. We also refer to them as stocks. In ecology, we would call them a population, and a, a group of organisms in a specific area that are, that are uh, you know, the same species. So we call a population people doing um, seafood, work in the seafood industry, et cetera, we usually refer to those as a stock. Any stock or any population is a result of various factors, in particular, things adding to the population and things taking away from the population. So the recruitment are the, are the babies coming in. Uh, growth is the biomass added to the individuals. And recall that a lot of times the units we use here, as you recall from your graphing exercises last week, um, is um, are, the term is landings, right? So it's biomass at the dock. So we don't typically count the number of fish in the hold, we just weigh the amount of fish in the hold and report them in a commercial context, report them as um, a, a weight. Okay, so, so the stock gets bigger when individuals come into the population and when those young individuals grow into larger adults, we lose individuals or, or we lose, or the population is reduced, excuse me, when we lose individuals, so when someone dies, because of disease or shark predation or something like that, or you and I uh, and, and or our agents go out and, and remove those individuals by catching them. The additional thing that we saw that the, the big invention in terms of seafood in the last uh, 30 years, we'll call it 30 or so years, not so much invention, but the, the thing that we started using much, much more is this notion of aquaculture. Aquaculture of anything that touches salt water, recall, is mariculture. So mariculture, one subset of aquaculture. Again, that can happen in the ocean. That can happen next to the ocean. These days, it can happen in the middle of the desert if you have salt water systems and things of that nature. Um, but, but increasingly, we're using mariculture, not just to grow up fish for you and me in some raceway over here, but actually using mariculture to try to grow up, for example, juvenile stages of the fish, get them to, to a little bit larger size than they normally would be just floating around as eggs or as larvae out in the, on the reef, and, and essentially stock populations, add to populations. And so increasingly, uh, or sorry, historically, excuse me, we've talked about uh, wild caught populations, right? So natural recruitment, natural input from from individuals out in the wild versus mariculture or aquaculture, which is the farming uh, of organisms. The reality is much of the future of seafood is going to be some kind of blending of the two. Blending of the two because our natural populations are, are highly stressed. Um, most of the fish stocks around the world are being fished what's called maximally, right, at, at maximum MSY, uh, maximum sustainable yield, or being overfished, right? So the vast, vast, vast majority, more than 85% of the fish stocks on the, on the planet are like that. So mariculture is one response. The other thing is um, many of our uh, healthy populations that we tend to think of as, as wild caught actually have a mariculture component. So, um, Alaskan seafood, right? A lot of us have heard about Alaska. Oh, I should have had my shirt on. I didn't have my shirt on. Maybe I'll go put it on when we take a break. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, fantastic seafood from Alaska, great stuff. Really, um, relatively speaking, well-managed fisheries, relatively well-managed fisheries, not fantastically managed. But um, they spend a lot of money on marketing. Alaska, the Alaska Fish Council spends a huge, or Seafood Council spends a huge amount of marketing to make you think Alaska is pure, to make you think Alaska is cold and clean and, uh, and just fantastic. And so 
for example, they don't, um, uh, unless it's in an experimental kind of context, they don't, um, they will tell you that we don't do fish farming. We don't do mariculture in um, Alaska. So all the Alaska stuff is wild caught and raw and natural, which is kind of a joke because huge numbers of their fish stocks are actually, not, not huge numbers, but some amount of their fish stocks, salmon runs um, are augmented. So we, 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 we stop, we can, you know, encourage um, babies to be born, release some of those babies in streams, et cetera. And then the fish live in the stream. In the case of salmon, they're anadromous, remember? So they spend part of their life in fresh water, part of their life in salt water. So they start off in uh, freshwater systems, run down to the ocean, at some point after they get larger, go down to the ocean, go out and then they live for a year, a couple years out in the ocean, feeding on oceanic foods, get much bigger, come back, swim up to their maternal stream and, and spawn and give birth, right? So uh, uh, that notion of sort of blending natural, what is purely wild, what is purely farmed is getting blurrier and blurry as we go as we go forward but people really have this notion they want you to think that wild is good wild is healthy wild is pristine and and ideal so the reality is what we have in our restaurants what we have in our markets is some mix of these different forces measure of natural recruitment measure of our additions to the population etc Um, and as you guys saw from your graphing exercise, um, we, we were increasing since World War II and all the introduction of technology and, and radar and, and winches and things of that nature. And we started getting better and better, being able to go to more and more distant places to find uh, seafood populations, stocks. And we exploited them. And as you saw last week, that it went up for a while, right? So the, so the, the harvest of wild caught populations went up for a while. And then basically in the 70s, it starts to table off. And by the time we get to the 80s, it doesn't increase anymore at all. What, what takes up its place is the um, aquaculture world, is the mariculture world, or the farm salmon, the farm shrimp, um, those kinds of critters. And that's what's meeting our continued demand and indeed our increased demand as human population increases further and further um, uh, each year. So, so whatever growth that we're um, experiencing to meet seafood demand is coming from um, farming. Um, okay, so that, that's again, just the background. Um, now, Let's talk about uh, what is what is sustainable. How are we doing on time? Okay, so what is sustainable, right? One of the tools that we've that's started up about 20, eh, 25 years or so ago, and then has really grown um, since then, is this notion of eco labels or eco certifications. Um, so there's two basic approaches here. One, there's the approach of a so-called green guide or eco guide, and the other is a certification. So here are some examples of certifications that I've uh, put up here. Um, th these are a mix of uh, different, some are from um, uh, different countries, some are from Europe, some are from Japan, um, et cetera. Uh, the two most that I think, well, let me just ask, which of these have you guys seen before? I've seen Dolphin Safe. Mm -hmm. uh, MSC. Mm -hmm. Good, any others? Yeah, I've seen Dolphin Safe and MSC. Yeah, excellent. So those, those are the, by far the most common ones that we see here in California. Um, uh, there are other, I mean, in theory, you could see all of these, but really most of, many of these are from other, you know, ge geographic jurisdictions and things of that nature. Dolphin Safe and MSC. Dolphin Safe, anybody know the, the Dolphin Safe story? No. Dolphins get eaten. I don't know. So the short version is um, uh, it's hard to find fish in the ocean, right? Um, so people spend their whole lives 
figuring out, well, maybe if we go here or we go here in the morning and there's, you know, da, 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 da. Um, um, fishermen spend a huge amount on things like weather maps, on things like uh, uh, bathymetry, uh, radar, sonar, things of that nature to try to locate stuff. But one of uh, the ways people historically figured out where they could find um, tuna was to look for dolphins. And so um, in a lot of cases when um, uh, we're, look we're looking for, sorry, somebody had a question? No, okay. Um, anyway, so a, a lot of cases, uh, tuna are going after bait fish, okay? And dolphin might be going after bait. They eat the same thing, right? And so you might get a bunch of tuna going around and um, uh, uh, you know, corralling some of these bait fish. So bait fish, remember, can swim in these big, so bait fish can be an individual fish uh, or they could be more typically in large schools. So these are these big giant balls of fish we see swimming around where they, you know, thousands and thousands of fish are kind of look like they're moving as one. So um, uh, tuna uh, can come as, as can marine mammals and other critters, they can actually act to corral these fish. So if you imagine you're out in the open ocean, how are you gonna catch this big ball of fish? Well, it's hard. You can, you can try to, to act to scare them together in a big ball, and then you can dart through the ball with your mouth open, basically. So it turns out that dolphin have learned that, hey, if we see a bunch of tuna going around, maybe we should follow those tuna and we'll be uh, more likely to catch some of these um, uh, bait fish. So as a consequence, uh, fishermen, when they were starting to get really good at following around uh, and having boats that could go very fast, being able to lay out purse seines, purse seines are, so, so we have this image of fishing with, with fish in line, hook in line. That's really not what most commercial fishing is. Most commercial fishing is using nets. So to lay out a net, put it down, scoop, boom, pull it up. And so in the case of um, uh, tuna, we do that with what's known as a purse seine net. So we have a big boat right here. We have a little chase boat and it runs out a little net around, boom, boom, boom. And, it, and it, it drops a curtain. You can imagine like a curtain in the water. And then once it gets, once it's laid out, you cinch the bottom, just like a purse, you cinch the bottom. So now everything that's inside that, that arena is trapped. And then we, we pull the net in and you get fish. In this case, um, uh, people that are going after tuna would do that, but they would, and they would figure out where the tuna was by looking at where the, where there was dolphin aggregating on the surface. And when they would, but when those nets would get drawn in, the dolphins would get drawn in too. And, um, so because dolphins are so social, they wouldn't just get stuck in the net sometimes. Sometimes they would, um, uh, uh, be able to get out theoretically, but there might be another member of their pod stuck in that net and they wouldn't leave them, right? So there's, there's all these kinds of reasons, but long story short, um, dolphin were what we would call a bycatch. So nobody was trying to eat dolphin, nobody was trying to kill dolphin, but they were just incidentally taken in the process of us doing our regular fishing activities. So, um, and this was going on for a lot and you know, killed tens of thousands of dolphins and things of that nature. And so, uh, in the late eighties or early eighties, I guess, mid eighties, um, this one guy was bothered by this. So he signed up to be a chef, a cook on a tuna boat. And he had an old camcorder and he just uh, started filming what was going on. And uh, so, you know, was on the cruise the whole time, film, 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 and uh, got back and he released it to with a group called Earth Island Institute, an uh, environmental NGO. And basically it caused this huge uproar, right? So it was, it was like all the, the uproar that comes from our um, mobile phone videos these days, when someone sees a cop doing something or somebody behaving like a racist or whatever, right? Same idea, except this is one of the first sort of sensational environmental uses of essentially, you might call it hidden or hidden camera, but it wasn't, it wasn't hidden per se. But um, people were, were totally ticked off and they were in an uproar. At the time, the epicenter of, uh, of tuna production 
was, uh, or one of the epicenters in the world was San Diego. Start off in LA, but it moved to San Diego. And so you had American companies here, Starkist, all these chicken of the sea, all these, all these uh, famous brands that everybody knew because a lot of people had tuna on their shelves in their pantry. Um, people started hearing that if I bought this can of tuna, I'm killing dolphins, right? And people hate to kill warm fuzzies, right? So things with big eyes, things that, um, you know, are, are mammalian, uh, we really have, it really strikes a chord with many humans, right? And so it's called this huge, caused this huge uproar and people said, that's it, I'm not gonna eat any tuna. So the industry freaked out. So rather than um, be regulated by a government agency saying, hey, you gotta do something differently, they essentially created a voluntary label and that was this notion called dolphin safe. And so the idea was they would only take certain kind of dolphins, albacore typically, albacore tuna. Excuse me, they excuse me, only take certain kinds of dolphins. They only take certain kinds of tuna. Sorry, tuna, tuna, tuna. Um, and they would do it in such a way that they would, um, if not completely eliminate, massively reduce the potential um, uh, to, to kill dolphins. And so it included things like drawing in the net. And then when the net got close, wait for a little bit, let the, let the net out so that the dolphins could, could swim out. Now they lost more tuna that way. So some of the tuna also escaped, but um, anyway, and then they put on observers and things of that nature that, that supposedly said that everything that was going on here was on the up and up, et cetera. So this dolphin safe label was a way the industry um, tried to save themselves so the industry said no 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 you should still be you should still buy tuna and that those practices were messed up we agree they're super bad they're super horrible we didn't do them or we're not doing that anymore and to convince you that what we're talking about is the truth we've created a seal and that seal is dolphin safe okay um so so that that's the first uh uh certification Go forward a little bit more. Okay, so now now we're we're getting into the 90s, and people are just getting really ticked off about how poorly managed many of our global fish fish stocks are. So, um, WWF, the the environmental NGO, international NGO, starts having conversations with the largest food um, uh, 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 processor on the planet which is Unilever. Unilever is a, a big, massive multinational that has many, many different, you know, sub companies and brands and stuff. But Unilever is this big, massive uh, uh, corporate entity of which one small part of its, of its operations are related to seafood. But nevertheless, WDF was having conversations with these guys and they said, you know, you guys should do something better. You guys should, should, should behave sus sustainably, responsibly. And the folks from Unilever basically said, yeah, we, we should. Yeah, let's do that. That's good. And, but actually we're doing a lot of good stuff already that you don't really understand. And so this, this conversation goes on for a while and, and uh, eventually involves other, other corporate entities, other environmental groups, et cetera. And what they end up doing is creating what's known as a third party certification. And that will grow into what, we, what you guys now know as MSC. The Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, so, what is what is MSC? Um, so, MSC is actually. Let me. I'll, I'll pause everything. So, MSC is um, not government. MSC is not private sector. MSC is independent of of both. So it's, it's, it's not a consumer, it's not a supplier, it's a so-called third party that's not a government agency, okay? So this third party certification says that I, you know, essentially I'm independent. I'm like an accountant. I'm, I'm agnostic, right? I'm neutral. So when you sit, make a claim, I'm going to evaluate your claim and I'm going to call balls and strikes objectively is the idea. So that uh, now you as, you as a consumer, we as consumers, we look at something and we're, we're wondering, hmm, is that sustainable? Uh, the answer is, well, let me check. 
it is the independent third party certifier as uh, information here. Do, the, do they say it's okay? And if they say it's okay, I have higher confidence the thing is gonna work or, the, or that the thing was, was harvested responsibly. Okay, so this started off with WWF and Unilever and they provided a lot of the, the initial uh, impetus and, and structure and funding, et cetera. But then MSC uh, spun off and is its own thing. So it's not actually owned or controlled by Unilever. It's not owned or controlled by an environmental group or anything of that nature. It's a, it's a third party thing. It's a, it's a, a nonprofit. It's an autonomous entity. Um, and the idea with Marine Stewardship Council is it acts to set standards. So it says what we mean by a sustainably harvested fishery is X. And if I am a seafood supplier, I can get certified. But if I want to get certified, I have to hire, uh, uh, well, I don't technically speaking hire MSC. I hire a consulting firm that's been accredited by MSC. So I'm going to, just like you'd hire a consulting firm to evaluate the hillside before you build a house or, or you know, to do an environmental impact statement, you know, that kind of thing, you hire, you'd hire a, a seafood certification consultant that was, that was accredited by MSC. They have to be accredited every, every few years. Dr. Uh, and they would go and they would do, a, so I would pay them a fee not pay them for the certification, I would pay them for the assessment. So they get paid. Uh, Dr. A, excuse yeah. me. Is, is it a possibility that um, everybody could possibly go to each of these individual organizations or even a company like Unilever to look for employment? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not sure what's going on right now with the pandemic. <laughs> Everybody sort of seems to be kind of yeah. shut in, but um, but absolutely, yeah, these folks hire people all the time. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, so the idea with the Marine Stewardship Council is, and we're not going to go into the details here because it gets it it gets fairly detailed, but basically they say, okay, this is what we define as a healthy fish stock. Okay, and and you know, it has to be self-reproducing, it has to be viable, et cetera. Here's what we consider a sustainable harvest of that fish stock, right? So, so both the quantity that of, of organisms that we take out, but also the mechanism by which we do that. If we're dynamite fishing on a coral reef, that's not gonna pass, right? So, 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 the, so what's, what's the harvest? How's the harvest being handled? And then after we've sort of crossed some of those bridges, then what's this notion of tracking, the so-called supply chain? The term is traceability. So that we might go through all this work and I might have a, a sustainably harvested uh, lobster, right? How do I know that when I, I put my lobster in a, in a cooler and send it off to the US, how do I know that somebody else hasn't thrown five other, you know, not sustainably harvested lobster in that same thing and, and are calling it, right? So all these things have to work together. So an item that gets to uh, say Vaughn's or, or Ralph's or wherever you're, you're shopping for food this weekend, the harvester of the seafood has to be certified, yeah? The pro if there's any processing, the processor has to be certified, right? The delivery mechanism has to be certified so that, so that we have traceability throughout the entirety of the distribution chain, of the supply chain to get to you. So all that stuff has to be in place. If all that stuff is in place, uh, then, then you, and you went to the store, you could see this symbol right here, which is the logo. So this is a copyrighted logo. This is defended in courts because again, if you're creating a third party certification saying this is an okay thing to eat, you don't want people illeg making illegal copies of the logo and sticking them on their, uh, your boxes of seafood or whatever. And so all this stuff is a, is a big process. So, so if I'm, a, if I'm a, 
a fisher if I, if I if i have a, a fishing territory in alaska let's say or something um i can apply for this msc certification i have to go through a couple different rounds um and once i get to that get that round and if i'm determined that i am not if i'm determined that i am sustainably harvesting great i have to show continued improvement though if so so some some fisheries are given provisional status some are said well you're not quite right but you're doing some decent stuff um and i can get in the process sort of like a, a temporary waiver for a short period of time or if i just get accredited i have to come back it's every three to five years i have to be recertified and i have to show continued improvement so i'm doing things to make this fishery more robust um, it could be things like outplanting. It could be things like augmenting the habitat. It could be like um, supporting things like marine protected areas. It could take a lot of different forms. But the point is, the, the what's supposed to happen with MSC is we all agree that none of us are perfect. We're starting somewhere, but as we go through time, we want everybody to be improving and get an increase the sustainability of these seafood items. So you can imagine doing doing these things, doing these extra steps, um, it costs more money, right? Than if we just did sort of illegal fishing in, at midnight and threw stuff on the black market and just went like that. So generally speaking, MSC certified stuff is gonna cost, it doesn't have to, but it, it generally costs a bit more. Whether it costs a little bit more or a lot more is gonna depend on the fish and the location and various things. But the idea is, informed consumers will be willing to pay a little bit more um, if they if they have confidence that this item is being supplied um, you know th th that's being supplied is, is sustainably harvested okay so there's all kinds of agencies that have that have spun up in, in different things in various flavors of this we have similar ideas in other industries um, probably the, the best known other one would be FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council, which tries to certify sustainably um, harvested wood products. Um, so uh, timber and things of that nature, paper, stuff of that nature. Um, but, but MSC is, is the main, is the 400 pound gorilla in terms of the seafood industry um, that everybody is, is, uh, is interested in uh, getting. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy around MSC. So a lot of people with all of these third party certifications, people, it's very common where people say something sustainable and someone goes and does an analysis and they find, oh my gosh, this isn't as, this isn't as good as we, as you think it is, you know, they're doing some bad stuff, but yet you're calling them sustainable. So it's, it's a constant dialogue. It's a constant ongoing conversation related to this. But the idea is that is a, um, a third party certification. The other example, and then we'll take a pause here in a moment for our break. The other uh, broad tool, so when we have this sort of um, eco certificate or, or green certificate, the other is a guide. So MSC is an actual seal. And it, I, I should also say, I didn't say this, but um, uh, I didn't put it on this particular image, but when you guys go to the store and you buy your item that's MSC certified, Somewhere on the package, usually it could be right here on sort of part of the, the um, uh, uh, inner circle or the curve of the logo. It can also be elsewhere on the package. There'll be a number, a unique identifier number. And what you can do is you can take that number, you put your cell phone when you're in the store, and you can Google that number or, or just Google Marine Stewardship Council on that number. And in fact, I think they have an app now. You can use the app too. But basically, um, you'd say, you know, Marine Stewardship Council, blah, 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 and search. And what you will be able to get, what you need to be able to get is a list, say exactly what the fish species is, where it was harvested, if it was processed in a, in a you know, a seafood plant or something, if it's, if it's fish sticks or something like that, right? Um, where that plant was, et cetera. So you should be able, and, and what, you know, when it was harvested, um, you might not know the exact date because it might be a lot of fish, but it would, it would tell you the approximate date at least. And so, um, so you, can, you can check when you see that this, this symbol says something. And if, and if this is hokey, it's kind of fish from New Zealand, H-O-K-I, if it's hokey from New Zealand and you type the number in and it comes up as salmon from 
Alaska, you know that someone has switched the numbers and that's, that, that's, that's a fake, fake MSC uh, certification. So, okay, so, so that's that. Um, so the other example, the, the other broad category are these green guides or buying guides. The most famous of which is the Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch program. Uh, if you go up to the, well, you can't go to the aquarium now because it's closed, but, but when things are back to normal and you can go back to zoos and aquaria and things, um, and you go to um, Monterey Bay Aquarium, you can actually pick up some of these so-called wallet cards. They're designed, they're, they're trifold or quadfold, so that they, they fold up and they, they're the size of a credit card, so they slip into your wallet or one of the slots in your wallet, it goes in your pocket. And that was by design. So the idea was you're out eating dinner somewhere and you're like, oh man, I feel like eating some seafood tonight. What you, seafood should I have? The idea is it would always be with you in your, in your back pocket or in your purse. We've now, for the last seven, eight years, we've now gone to apps. So now they have a mobile app and most people are accessing this content through their cell phone, not through the traditional wallet cards, but they're, they're the same idea. The idea is they're on hand in demand when you are at the store or, or at the restaurant. They, they bin things into some simple groups. Now, when we were um, primarily focused on the wallet cards here, we didn't have much space, right? If it's a, you have a little card, there's only so many lines of text. So you had to make choices. The cool thing with the app is it's unlimited choices. So you can have everything listed. Regardless, the items are broken down into three broad categories. And to be simple, uh, they're patterned after a, a traffic signal. Green, yellow, red. Red means do not eat ever ever, ever, ever. Green means this is the, if you need some seafood, this is the best choice. This is sustainably harvested, uh, you know, all that kind of good stuff. Yellow is not as good as green. If you have the option to do green, I would do green. But um, yellow is better than the red. So again, just like we were talking about before, instead of saying absolutely no, never, we're trying to give people informed, or we're trying to give people information so they can make informed decisions. So um, we go from, uh, you know, uh, best choice, okay to eat, don't have guilt if you want to eat this, red, really, really, really don't eat this, and then yellow, eh, you got to make the call kind of thing, right? Um, and so there are, are other guides, there's Blue Ocean Guide and others, but, but, um, but the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch is really the, the, the largest one, at least in our part of the country. Um, and so, so there's, there's two ways you can get information. You can get information, or there are two, two uh, ways of looking at the sustainability of, of seafood items. Third-party certifications like um, uh, Dolphin Safe or MSC, or buying guides like um, uh, Seafood Watch. Cool. Questions about either of those? Does anybody, out of curiosity, does anybody have, before we start talking, does anybody have the Seafood Watch app on their on their phone? Yeah. Yeah. Two, three. Yeah. Paper copy, two. Uh-huh, four, cool. Okay, cool. So again, it, it, the app is a free app um, and, uh, and, and you can, you know, download it and, and you can type whatever uh, you want in. Um, how it works is essentially how, how, the, how the evaluation goes for, I'll just finish up with, with the Seafood Watch to say that um, uh, there's uh, panels of experts that get called in, uh, you know, professor types like me and chefs and, and seafood advocates and stuff every so often and they'll evaluate stuff. So just because something gets on the list as a best choice doesn't mean it's always a best choice or because something is an avoid doesn't mean it's always an avoid. So the idea is periodically, these items are evaluated. We want to make sure that if we had it green, it's it's you know it, it still is green, or if it's green, it hasn't slipped to yellow, et cetera. So what you'll find in these, it was very hard with the cards, but it's gotten better with the app. Um, it's not always, it's not just um, tuna, right? It's going to say ahi tuna, or it's going to re reference the harvest method, pole caught ahi tuna. Um, or, or, you know, so, so there'll be more details in there. So, so usually um, 
increasingly you you have the option to get finer scale rather than just type the name of the fish in and and a lot of times that that requires you to know a little bit more about the geography or a little bit more about the harvest method of the the uh, seafood item in question okay um and i think we'll take a pause there and we'll come back after our 10 minute break i think we'll just we'll take our 10 minute break now cool all right yep. this okay i think we're about i think we're about back now so just to uh, wrap up this this con intro conversation here to our seafood project, <clears throat> so we have a couple different categories of tools out there. We have uh, uh, a thir independent third party certification. We have uh, independent groups giving us buying guides to help help guide our purchase. One of the reasons we need such help is because of the diversity of items that are out there now which what you will find when we start getting the data is there actually isn't that massive a diversity in terms of what you have easily at your fingertips if we start going to um, non-mainstream things uh, seafood specialty restaurants um, uh, Asian markets, things of that nature, will actually start to get into some of the cool diversity that's out there. Um, but regardless, uh, whether we easily see it in terms of the package labeling or not, uh, seafood is coming from around the world and is moving around the world. So for those of us in the developed world, primarily we are eating items from um, the developing world, the other parts of the planet. So this global seafood supply thing is set up to bring um, the world's seafood to your plate. Um, but let's talk about what's going on with the current state of affairs is in um, our local fishery. You know, we, we have, we have a, amazing fish populations here, amazing marine diversity right here uh, in Ventura and Ventura County and in the Santa Barbara Channel. And so I just want to highlight that for you guys a little bit. Uh, now, as we go in and do our surveys, there's going to be a lot of things that you don't, you don't know. Um, a lot of things that I don't know. Um, there's a very common thing that's, that happens with um, seafood sales, which is to really work on marketing. And when people uh, associate a bad name with something or, or poor practice, generally speaking the industry will come up with a new name for that fish so the common names are really very difficult can be very difficult to keep track of and are very amorphous so red snapper if you see red snapper who knows what the heck that is that that's sort of like uh it's not as bad as just calling it fish but it pretty much is just fish it's hard to know um, but but having said that, let's at least look a little bit at some of the diversity of seafood that we produce here on our own state. So these are the major commercial uh, fishing ports uh, in California. Again, recall that how the, the logistics works here, um, we report uh, items as, as their point of landing. So when you see seafood that says seafood's from China, maybe it came from China, maybe it was caught in Indonesian waters by a Chinese trawler and then the Chinese trawler went back home so there, there are issues with that, um, to be sure, but it's what it's the data we have. So in the case of California, if stuff is caught commercially, uh, it will come. It will be reported as one of these landing uh, ports or being brought into the state in one of these ports. And obviously, the, the closest one for us is Santa Barbara. And this is the the average number of species reported landing at these different ports 
um, for this uh, nine year period um, from this data was compiled a couple of years ago, but, but the main trend still con, uh, is, is still valid. And that is Santa Barbara, much more diverse than the other fishing uh, harbors around the state. Concomitantly, it's the most valuable port in terms of commercial landings. Um, now, some others come close. LA comes close. Um, Eureka comes close. Uh, Eureka, a lot of that is ground fish and crab. Um, LA, a lot of that is um, uh, squid. Uh, even though Santa Barbara gets some squid, but it, it, most of the squid goes to, to LA. Anyway, the point is there's relatively um, hot spot for commercial fishing in California, um, our region. I should just note all of these numbers were much higher historically, right? But, but for the current landscape of fisheries management, Santa Barbara is um, one of the, the best places if you wanted to be a fisherman in California. It's still very tough to be a fisherman in California. I'm not trying to say it's great, but, but we're, we pull in a lot of fish. And uh, what you see from this is that we pull in the second most biomass of fish. The um, LA pulls in more. Again, a lot of that is squid, which is very tasty and, and all that, but on a, a price per pound basis, it's not as valuable as some of the things that more typically come into Santa Barbara, like lobster and uh, white sea bass and things of that nature. Okay. So now this may not make sense to some of you that aren't fishermen or haven't thought about uh, your seafood, but these are um, the, the typical things we, we see here in California. So market squid is lolligo. That's what we eat calamari. That's what calamari is. Um, now, when you're, when you're going to, we'll talk about the surveys next, but when you go out and do your surveys, you're going to uh, try to figure out what all these items are. Okay, um, you're gonna do your best. Might not be able to get it perfectly, right? And so again, I'm not assuming you're a, a PhD ichthyologist doing the survey. You're you're a interested, but nevertheless, you know, person off the street. So you want to know, hey, what is this? So they could say, in the case of market squid, they could say calamari, right? Which is um, Italian word for for squid. There's various types of squid. A very species of squid. Um, mostly, what we're getting in California is this lolligo. Is this is this market squid? Uh, spiny lobster. Uh, that would be what, what we eat as lobster. When you go and or get Maine lobster with the big claws, that's that's different. Ours is a is a type of rock lobster. So ours is what we eat is the tail. Whereas the stuff you get from New England, it would be the claws and the and the tail. Um, but spiny lobster. Uh, urchin, so red sea urchin. Uh, most of the urchin is consumed uh, by through in Asian markets. So we don't eat that much um, urchin right now. Uh, the the thing that people consume is you guys know what uni is. Let me know what uni is. U N I. It's that yellow icky stuff that's inside it. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's that? Exacts or the, you know. Yeah, the gonads. You're eating the gonads of the oh. urchin. So uh, the urchin urchins are, are grazers. So they're gonna uh, hang out. And and if everything is good, and life is good for them, they're just gonna sit in their crack in the rock, on the reef, and basically catch detritus, catch pieces of giant kelp, et cetera, that float down, stick on their spines or get caught on their tube feet and they munch that. And if they're getting lots of food like that, they'll just, they'll, they're fat and happy. They put a large fraction of their energies into their reproduction. So healthy reefs have urchins with large gonads. The vast majority of the, of the inside of their skeleton, of their test is, is gonad. Once the reef gets stressed, El Nino comes along, something of that nature, and the productivity of the reef crashes, they will start to starve. The first thing they'll do is reabsorb their gonads. 
And then once they're, once they've absorbed all that energy, uh, then they'll actually form what we call urchin barons, which are big giant fronts of urchins. And they all come out and they just start, they're, they're, they're starving. So they'll just go and they'll go across the reef and they'll mow down everything, macroalgae and, and what have you. And, and it's a, it's a huge challenge for the reefs. So, um, so when people are buying urchin, they're primarily buying them for uni. They're primarily buying them for the gonads. Uh, spot prawns are a kind of small shrimp. Uh, rock crab um, is, you know, crab. It's pretty, pretty uh, obvious, but, uh, relatively large claws. Another type of shrimp is the ridgeback prawn. White sea bass is, uh, right, is that big fish. White sea bass is this guy right here on the upper right. So relatively uh, nice fish, tastes, tastes great, very popular for spearfishing and other things. Uh, where was I, white sea bass? Warty sea cucumber, again, something that we don't really eat that, that much here. Um, when I was in the, in the South Pacific, uh, a lot of these, a lot of the um, uh, women like to eat them as snacks when they're out harvesting on the reef. Um, and they will, in the South Pacific, they'll eat the cucumbers. So the cucumbers, when they freak out, they will, they will throw out their guts as sort of a defense mechanism, like a, like a lizard drops its tail, that kind of idea. And so there the women would, would freak them out and, and uh, eat their guts basically, and then throw the sea cucumber back and they would hopefully be alive. Um, in our case, our sea cucumbers are sent again to the Asian market and they're primarily sold and they're pickled and, and cooked uh, in Asian cuisine. Uh, same with the red cucumber. Halibut is a flatfish. You guys probably have heard of halibut. You guys probably eaten halibut. Um, uh, tasty fish uh, associated with the bottom. Uh, thorny head is a, uh, is a fish. And then a couple uh, rock crabs. So those are our most, uh, the most dominant um, uh, individuals in terms of the total landings in California. Um, how do we harvest these things? So we harvest the in California and around the world, but in California in particular, we have a variety of harvest methods. So we use harpoons for high value, big giant honking things that we can charge a large amount of money for. Because you can imagine throwing a harpoon is a lot of individual labor and a lot and hard. So you have to pay people more than if you say, you can imagine we put out a net and we get a thousand fish, right? There's, there's uh, much more profit in that. So, so harpoon is generally reserved for things that are very expensive. That would be things like your billfish, swordfish, et cetera, and some of the, the high-end large tunas. Um, and you'll also, okay, so that, that's one option. The other option is um, a regular um, a fishing pole type of type approach, right? Where you have a, a, a hook and you put it over. In some cases, these are baited. In some cases, they're not. Um, long lining. Long lining is where we put out a line that has a big long line and then off of that line are other uh, uh, fishing lines that are hooked and baited usually. And so that's for doing lar usually large sets. So you lay that out and by a fishing line, I mean like miles and miles and miles and miles long. Uh, harpoon is pretty specific, right? Harpoon is, is our most specific um, harvest method. If you throw the harpoon in something, you know what it is. As we start going down here with some of these other methods, um, we're not necessarily able to be as specific. And the amount of bycatch, so unintended items that are collected, goes up. And bycatch is a huge problem. One of the reasons we have such problems with our um, marine fisheries. Um, but anyway, so pull in line is Okay, pollen. Long line is a classic thing where we get a lot of unintended items, uh, kill other things, even not even just fish, things like albatrosses will die because an albatross will be flying over something or, or see what they think is a squid because there's a, a squid baited on a hook and they'll dive down and, and you'll get fish, you'll get sharks, you'll get all kinds of things that you didn't intend to get. So long lining is pretty non-specific. A trolling, Trolling is where we basically essentially have a fishing line, but we are moving through the water with that line. And it's usually a set, usually multiple hooks. Uh, uh, drift or gill netting. 
um, is an extremely non-specific harvest method. So a huge amount of bycatch as well with this. The idea there is a net is set. And in modern technology, in modern approaches, it's usually set and let go. So there'll be some kind of satellite beeper or some kind of tracker on it. Ship sets it off. It's a flow, it's a walled net. And a net has all these, you know, has all these squares. The idea with a net is in this context, a fish is swimming, bloop, 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 put it, put its head in there. If it's a little teeny fish, you can go through the the, the mesh, no problem. But if they're about the right size, the fish will come, and, and usually it'll be made out of something like monofilament, something that looks more or less invisible uh, in the water. So it's hard to detect. So the fish is swimming, choo, 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 choo. and then, oh, put my head in. And, oh my gosh, most fish have uh, breathed through their gills, which are covered by things called gill rakers and opercula. So the, these flaps basically. And, uh, and they, they open up like this, right? They open the back like that. And so I go in and, oh, oh my gosh, I get stuck. Well, fishes don't have shoulders, but if I was a fish, my shoulders would get stuck, right? And I go, oh, I can't go any farther. Okay, I'll try to back out. But as I try to back out, the, the, oftentimes the, the mesh will kind of come along my, the side of my body, right? And get caught on my gills. And so that's where the term gill net comes from. Uh, trawl is something that is drug. So we drag it uh, behind the boat, um, usually on the bottom. It doesn't have to be on the bottom, but usually it's on the bottom. Um, uh, and those are, those are also potentially quite destructive, not so much partly for unintended consequences, but because it really trawls, otter trawls in particular, can really, really nuke the bottom. So anywhere where there's hard structures, that could be a coral reef, that could be a, a rocky reef or whatever, it's, it can really screw stuff up. Um, and so it's, it's people liken, historically have likened that to um, strip mining the ocean. A lot of fishermen take objection with that, but, but it, it, can be, it can be quite um, destructive. Persanes, we already talked about. Persane is a net that you, you put around, you, you set it around the population of, of critters, very large you know, big, big wide net, and then you, you tighten it up and you squinch the bottom, you, 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 sane, you, 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 you cinch up the very bottom part so it makes a bowl, and then you pull the whole thing onto the boat. Uh, and then we have uh, traps in pots. So crab pots, lobster pots, lobster traps, these things. These are, these are cages that, uh, again, have, have mesh, so the water can flow in and out, and they're usually baited. And the crab or, or or um, lobster, whatever, can crawl in, and they, they usually have some kind of funnel type device, or sometimes it's sort of like a, a pop open door, so it's easy to get in, but it's hard to get out. Um, um, yeah, and then what happens is the fisherman comes around, pulls those up on a boats, and then and then looks at the individual. If the individual is the legal size and the and the organism you wanted to get saves it, if it's too small, whatever, it can be thrown back. But you have to be careful because if you just randomly throw it in the ocean, there could be some fish there, and they're like, oh, "I'm gonna eat this." So it isn't necessarily, say, you know, high survivorship if the individual falls off. But um, increasingly, these traps and pots have escape valves for smaller uh, non-target uh, individuals. Uh, and then, and then perhaps the most important local fishery. It, well, I guess maybe that you could argue that would be lobsters, but but. Um, Certainly, one of the ones that's the most um, uh, uh, iconic, or at least eye-catching, are our squid fishing boats. So these are boats. That, so squid are positively phototactic. So when the um, when when uh, so the idea is squid are down deep because they get preyed on by other fish and stuff, right? Everybody loves to eat squid. Um, so the idea is at night, night goes away, moon comes up. The, um, the squid will go towards, swim towards the moon and then get into the shallows and they can feast on little small fish. As the sun comes up, they go back down into deeper depths, darker, darker waters. Um, and so the idea with this is you have these big giant boats that mimic the moon. So, these, so just like a construction site on the 101, you might be driving past or something like that. Um, uh, you know, these big and insane metal halide, like the lights that kind of, you know, make your eyes hurt when you drive by at night. 
that kind of thing. So we'll line the edge of the boat with these big giant bright lights. The fishing all happens at night. The boats go out, uh, anchor, turn on their lights, wait, and then they start what's known as jigging. So they start, they start um, uh, uh, catching the, the um, squid that come to the surface. Uh, and they, and, they, and they, do, they do the fishing right there, right at the, you know, near the, the surface of the water. They don't, they don't fish deeply. There are certain spots that are really, really, because of the, the bottom topography, et cetera, are really, really attractive to squid, partly because they're coming into the shallows to spawn. So that is some air, there's some of the areas around Catalina, um, uh, the area just off of Deer Creek and Malibu, the Malibu coast. And there's a couple other spots up in Santa Barbara. So there's, uh, there's a few others in the Channel Islands. So it, they don't necessarily just go any random place. There, there are definite hot spots in places that are way, way, way more productive for squid jigging. Um, so those are some examples of some of the different harvest methods. So when you guys go to record your stuff, a lot of times they're going to say, I don't know. Well, how, how did you have this, you know, where did this fish come from? How'd you harvest it? It came from the sea, you know, so you just say unknown. But if you do know something, these are some of the options that someone might articulate or the package might articulate. Um, yeah, so uh, we have a couple broad categories of, of how we have historically managed fish stocks. Um, demersal or, or benthos associated fish. These are fish that are gonna hug the ground or be mostly on the ground. And these guys tend to be uh, close into the continents, right? Close into us where we are in the continental shelves and shoulders. Then there's, and so examples would be um, things like uh, rockfish, um, halibut, stuff of that nature. Pelagic fish are things that are swimming up in the water column that generally are not near structures. And so these would be things like our tunas, um, anchovies, things of that nature. Um, and then uh, the crustaceans. So for us, that's going to be crabs, shrimp, and lobster are primarily what we're talking about here. Um, we also do eat a fair amount of mollusks. So normally when people hear of mollusks, they think snails. So they think things like abalone, which is totally correct. Uh, if we were in Key West, you'd eat conch. You'd eat, you'd eat a big, uh, a big uh, sort of similar version. When we're eating, uh, we're eating, when we're eating the demersal fish and the pelagic fish, generally speaking, we in America eat the fillets. We eat the mussels. Crustaceans, we're also eating the mussels, usually of their claws or tails. With mollusks, we're generally speaking, eating their foot. Um, so mollusks are uh, uh, abalone, they are octopus, they are squid. Um, and so for the abalone, except for eating the foot, for the squid and octopus, we'll actually eat the whole, the whole critter. Um, yeah, okay. Um, uh, so just, uh, we mentioned before MPAs, MPAs are a huge deal in California, right? Watch those lectures. Um, but, uh, generally speaking, the MPAs are influencing how we fish. So with the establishment of our modern MPA network over the last, you know, 20 years, um, essentially we've said you cannot fish inside some of these areas. So the main regulation, the main the main thing that MPAs are regulating is fishing activity, is extracting. The idea there, again, is to create some re spatial refugia where these critters can be inside, these fish can be inside and be protected from fishing. So the idea is we hopefully get what we call spillover. And so that spillover um, uh, uh, can, can lead to larger fish populations outside the marine protected area. So the goal of marine protected areas to boost biodiversity, to boost fish populations, to boost abundance. Um, and I just put this one, I tossed this slide in here just to note that um, there's continued pressure from the current administration to change protected areas. And that includes marine protected areas. So they've been trying to eliminate um, uh, uh, restrictions, um, not so much on fisheries, but for oil and gas extraction. But, but because marine protected areas also impact uh, what you can do in terms of energy extraction oftentimes, 
um, even though that's not the, the focus, not the main thing. Um, the current administration, federal administration, has been really uh, interested in trying to uh, uh, reduce those, change those, allow other uses inside of them. Obviously, we're getting a different administration in a in several weeks, um, but uh, the fact remains: these protected areas are never protected forever. They're they're always something we have to work on if if we believe that's a a useful um, technique. Okay, so there you go. So that that, that that's a quick intro to. Oh, yeah, this, this is this is our, sorry, this is our um, most recent uh, uh, take on MPAs. Again, watch our watch my lectures, but long story short, we we organize the California coast into a couple different regions. Our region is called the South Coast region. And um, and this is before we start the process, how many no take reserves A no take means you can't do any fishing at all, any recreational fishing, any commercial fishing, etc. And the overhaul converted them from, from there being three to there being 29 when the process was concluded in terms of the, the state's network of marine protected areas. This does not count the federal network. Um, anyway, but, but it, it's gone up and we're currently, um, our, our statewide networks are, are robust. It's the um, larger ones that are controlled by the federal government that seem to be always under assault. Okay. All right, questions about any of that stuff? <clears throat> 